culture. Uh, for those who may not know, the Institute of World Culture is a nonprofit educational institute founded in 1976 26. and located at 1407 Chapala Street in Santa Barbara. Uh, it is dedicated to assisting the ideal of lifelong learning, both in its own community and abroad, in particular in uh, to assist in the understanding of our own as well as other cultures and to begin envisioning the possibilities of a world civilization in which universal brotherhood, mutual tolerance and understanding in the celebration of diversity, as well as nonviolence begin to become governing principles. In fact, the theme for the year is opening doors through nonviolence and magnanimity. Uh, for more information on this theme, as well as other activities of the Institute, uh, one can uh, find them on uh, the website at worldculture.org. My name is Kirk Gradeen, and I'll be serving as the chair for today's event. The program today is titled Meditations on Yoga, and our presenter is Srinivas Chari. We're very fortunate that Mr. has consented to provide us with introduction and discussion of two great classics of Indian literature and philosophy. First, the short but highly revered and aphoristic text attributed to Patanjali known as the Yoga Sutras or Yoga Aphorisms. And secondly, the Bhagavad Gita, a sacred scripture central to Hinduism uh, that comes in the form of a dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna who are poised in the battlefield and on the threshold of the great epic war of the Mahabharata. The Gita, however, as many know, is today globally recognized, read and studied as a universal classic and guide to the spiritual quest. And uh, both of these texts, as uh, Philip Goldberg uh, points out in his book on American Veda, have been influencing and permeating uh, spirituality in Western culture um, since the 1800s really, and, and particularly in the US through uh, Emerson and Thoreau, uh, beginning with Emerson and Thoreau, but many other great uh, uh, authors and uh, influential uh, intellects um, down through the decades. Uh, the 10 aims of the Institute are articulated in the Declaration of Interdependence, which can be found on the IWC website. And they provide a foundation for all Institute programs. Um, several of the Institute aims will be touched on today, but in particular, aims number one and five are relevant to today's topic. And I'll just go ahead and read those out. Number one, is to explore the classical and Renaissance traditions of East and West and their continuing relevance to emerging modes and patterns of living. And number five is to deepen awareness of the universality of man's spiritual striving and its rich variety of expression in the religions, philosophies, and literatures of humanity. Srinivas Chari was born in Bangalore, India in 1936 and had his early education in schools run by theosophists. Uh, later with a degree in engineering from the prestigious IIT, he went on to serve the manufacturing industry, both in India and the US, to which he migrated with his family in 1982. When in India, he studied Hatha Yoga with Kaivalyadam IYC in Mumbai for three years. Uh, the school had been founded by Swami Kulva Yananda, uh, a yoga teacher who apparently uh, instructed Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, the Swami uh, also was a physician by training and was known for having introduced yoga therapy to the modern world. Uh, after his retirement, Srinivas um, obtained an MA in liberal arts and started to study ancient Indian classical literature, including the epics uh, and other Sanskrit texts, such as the Yoga Sutra, the Gita, and the Artha Shastra. 
And he now lives uh, in a retirement retirement community in Camarillo with his wife, Prema. So we're, uh, as I mentioned, very lucky to have Shrini Voss presenting for us today. So whenever you're ready, Shrini Voss, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your nice introduction. It was a pleasant surprise when I got a message from Robert asking me whether I could give a talk on yoga to the IWC. I always looked upon this organization as an oasis of sanity in the world, which at times appears to have gone astray. So I consider it an honor to have been asked to speak at this venue. I believe that yoga has always been a practice that promoted a culture of peace and nonviolence and benevolence towards all living beings. It is an attempt to pull us out of our egotistical, individualistic mode, break out of it, and try to go towards a higher goal of seeing unity in all of creation. As the Gita says, a yogi will look with an equal eye on a Brahmin possessed of learning, a cow, an elephant, or a dog, or even a dog eater. So a yogi will not differentiate between a particular religion or race or nationality. And as yoga gains acceptance and popularity in the world, hopefully as a world culture, it will undoubtedly promote nonviolence and magnanimity among nations and peoples of all regions. Uh, let me get here to the share screen so that. Okay. And now a slideshow. That's good. We're good Is to go. Okay? It's We're good all right? to go. Yes. Okay. With that, let us get into the introduction of the two texts that seem best to define the practice and purpose of yoga, namely the Yoga Sutra, Patanjali, and the Bhagavad Gita and examine how a study of these two is likely to promote the aims of this organization. If time permits, we will give a brief account of those responsible to transmit the knowledge to the United States. Uh, Srinivas, could you go back and do slideshow again for some reason? You, you can slideshow. Sorry, go back to? Slideshow, you know, up at the PowerPoint slideshow. Yes. Select that. Okay. And then go over play from beginning. From the beginning. The far left. There you go. Okay. okay. Is it okay now? We're good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. In the earliest composition of Rig Veda, in the creation hymn, uh, the sages started questioning the foundations of existence or reality. In his creation hymn, the Veda asked who the creator of the universe was and suggested, the, the sages suggested it was that or that which existed before all that we know and all that we do not. And before everything and nothing as we understand it, all have come out of that, which was before the comprehension of men. In later Upanishad, this concept was extensively expanded with the famous saying, Tattvamasi, that thou art. Everything in the universe was an expression of that. Most of the Hindu philosophical systems were an attempt to understand the reality of that. And yoga was an attempt to experientially to realize that. 
in Vedanta, the philosophical tradition of the Upanishads, the trace of the all-encompassing Brahman is said to be expressed in each jiva or individual being. And this was translated as self or soul or spirit, the Atman. This micro, thus the microcosm, the Atman, was a reflection of the macrocosm, Brahman, or the universal consciousness, or whatever you want to call it. Therefore, the purpose of yoga was to liberate the Atman from the embrace of Jiva, the individual being, and go on to yoga with that thought, variously described as Paramatman, Supreme Spirit, Brahman, ultimate reality, etc., etc. And for those who are not theists too, it was seen as a practice to liberate them from the coils of earthly existence. At the time of the two tests, I mean two texts, Yoga Sutra and the Gita, which were possibly in their final form around the beginnings of the common era, there already existed in India six orthodox schools of philosophy or visions of reality called Darshana, founded by the ancient sages, as well as two heterodox schools, Jainism and Buddhism, and also a rather rational and materialistic system known as Charavak. Of the six orthodox schools of philosophy, the first two Purva Mimamsa and Uttara Mimamsa, or Vedanta, were strongly theistic. The next two, Sankhya and Yoga, acknowledged the authority of the Vedas and accepted that there could be a higher you know, consciousness, but did not go too deep into it. Nyaya and Shinshika were concerned with logic and reasoning that mattered properly. In Yoga Sutra, the role of a Supreme Purusha person is acknowledged, but not emphasized as an essential feature. Devotion to the Lord was a way to liberation, but not the only way. In the Gita, which on the other hand is based on Vedanta, the Lord is both universal and personal, and Yoga provided many paths to salvation depending on the nature of the person, or rather the dominant qualities in one's nature. The two heterodox systems, Jainism accepts the possibility of individual spirit, but not of any supreme being. And Buddhism does not mention either. Both are clearly non-theistic. The way of yoga in one form or another is utilized by all these different systems. And whereas it's acceptable to them as a means of liberation, that differ as to its ends. For the Buddhists, it is nirvana or enlightenment. To the Vedantins, it's moksha or liberation, leading to an attachment with the deity of their choice or complete absorption in the universal consciousness, Brahman. For all of them, though, it is liberation from the seemingly endless cycle of birth and death. And all of them believed in a moral code called Dharma. The yoga system of Indian philosophy is considered by scholars to have evolved as a corollary to the Sankhya system of Kapil, formed around 1200 BC the latter providing the principles, while the former the practice towards self-realization. The Sankhya system is considered the earliest of six darshanas, or visions of reality, and its founder is said to be the ancient stage Kapila, possibly around 1200 BC. Knowledge was transmitted verbally in those days, and the earliest surviving text in the subject, written by perhaps around 200 of the common era is called Sankhya Karika, authored by Ishwara Krishna. In Sankhya, which literally means count, 
the system tried to enumerate all phenomena by numbers. Thus, human experience, the world, is described in the system as being constituted of 25 elements. The first being termed Purusha, a person, and the other 24 other objects of its experience. Purusha is the immortal self in all beings, and Prakriti, or primal nature, is made up of all the rest, which include Mahat, Buddhi, Ahankara, Egoism, the mind, Manas, the sensory organs, eyes, ears, tongue, skin, nose, the motor organs, hands, legs, mouth, excretory, reproductive organs, the subtle elements, sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell, the gross elements, earth, water, air, fire, and ether. As you'll notice, the way the Sankhya system works is it sees from inward out, from the self or the atma within, outwards towards the universe. And whatever it could experience as prakriti or nature is what is described in Sankhya. Purusha is immortal, a permanent witness to all there is. Prakriti or nature is ever changing, subject to modifications of time and space, and is never static. Purusha uses Prakriti to experience this samsara, but enmeshed in her, he loses his sense of separateness. He is only through yogic meditation one realizes one's complete status, independent status as an actor and knows that one is near, merely playing a role and recognizes nature as a mere fleeting experience. And then freed from this trance, one gains nirvana. And Prakriti, having been seen as transient, withdraws. In other words, when we realize that we are really the inner self, which has been embodied by nature and not part of nature itself, we attain liberation and nature ceases to have any hold on us. All yoga since the time of Kapila was an attempt to experience this connection between Purusha and Prakriti and ultimately to dissociate the two so that Purusha could then be free to rest in tune with his or her own true self independent of the effects of nature or samsara. Nature is like a movie that exists only for our transitory experience, to be enjoyed and not to be mistaken for reality. That is Sankhya. In Sankhya, realization was complete when Purusha realizes independent status. To thieves of Vedantins, the self or Atman will then merge and be attached to Paramatma or the Supreme Self in what is termed moksha or liberation. To the non-theists such as the followers of Buddha, one attains the state of enlightenment and liberation from all suffering. In the Jaina tradition, it would be attainment of a state of kaivalya or solitude. Yoga accepted the concept of Purusha and Prakriti from Sankhya, but went further and provided a path to liberation by the prescription of an actual practice by which such liberation could be attained. The path of yoga was the scene as the way to self-realization in all these belief systems, in the Vedanta, in the Buddhist, and as well as the Jain system. The Kundalini system of yoga coming from a different and possibly non-Vedic tradition provides its own unique path to transcendence. And its Shiva as universal consciousness and Shakti as primal energy take the place of Purusha and Prakriti. In this talk, we'll cover some of the basic features of the two texts, elements of yoga philosophy as described in the Gita, and the aphorisms on yoga contained in the Yoga Sutra. 
both these texts written possibly over 2000 years ago uh, remain along with them many translation and commentaries and have a lasting spring of yogic wisdom and knowledge. So let us try to uncover some of the features, starting with the Yoga Sutra. Yoga is a system of meditation and mortification of the body to attain transcendence over one's nature had existed for centuries prior to the Yoga Sutra or aphorisms on yoga. It has been referred to in the Vedas as well as in some of the Upanishads as also in a text depicting a dialogue between the ancient sage Yajnavalkya and Gargi, a female adept, possibly around the 8th century BC. The Yoga Sutra Patanjali, however, is the earliest complete text of the manual and is available for our study. The pithy aphorisms are 195 in number, divided into four pada or parts. The first part lays down the general principles of meditation and describes the conditions under which the yogi's self-identity is absorbed in pure consciousness. The second is a prescriptive manual of Kriya Yoga or disciplines to follow and Ashtanga Yoga or the procedure of yoga with eight Anga or limbs of the practice and delineates the requirements of each of the first five that deal with our physical nature. The third pada defines a psychic nature and requirements for the final three limbs of yoga that lead to samadhi or absorption, the final phase in a meditative practice. It also lists the supranormal and supernatural powers called siddhis that one can attain with the practice, with the warning that they should never be used with egotistical purposes in mind. The fourth part, a section of the manual, deals with the attainment of transcendence and discusses the situation of the yogi in this final phase of the practice. Here, one is said to attain a state described as being in a meditative cloud of virtue. One might conclude in brief that the sutras provide a passage from the gross to the subtle and finally to the supreme state of awareness. Chris Chappell calls yoga a continuous process of progressive subtleization of one's focus, which is directed away from gross manifestations of chitta vritti, fluctuations of the mind, to the most sublime aspects of prakriti. For this, Patanjali provides the sutras in the sutras, myriad paths to the goal, and several descriptions of the goal once it has been achieved. Little is known of Patanjali himself. It is not clear whether he's the same person as the one who wrote a classic text on Sanskrit grammar in second century BC. In that he wrote of Greek soldiers in some of his examples, and so might have lived around 150 BC when the Bactrian king Menander ruled parts of the Punjab. Some scholars disagree with this and put a later date around 200 CE when he might have composed the sutras. And some even suggest that he's the same person as Vyasa, who wrote a commentary on the sutras around 400 or 500 of the common era. In Hindu Vaishnava mythology, he's seen as an avatar of the cosmic serpent, Seshana, who lies coiled in the Milky Way and came down to the earth as an avatar of the, in order as uh, Patanjali, in order to lead humanity to the feet of the Lord. So that's the theistic mythological version of Patanjali. 
the sutras or threads themselves are short, pretty summarized statements of the teachings. In view of the short and concise nature of the aphorisms, it has always needed detailed explanations and interpretations. They have therefore attracted various commentaries throughout the ages, starting with one by Vyasa mentioned earlier in fourth or fifth century. Later centuries produced works by Mishra, Bhojaraja in the 11th century, Vikyana Bhikshu in the 16th century, and uh, later, Swami Vivekananda in the 19th century, who came to the United States, gave it the name Raja Yoga and published it from New York. Now we have been many more translation and commentaries, including one by Christopher Eshavod and Swami Prabhavananda Vedanta Society here in Hollywood, a popular one by Swami Satchidananda, which is the one I followed and recently won by our own Chris Chap of Boiler Mary Mark. Now let's look at some of the basic elements of Patanjali's teachings. The first four uh, sentence aphorisms of Patanjali itself lays down clearly the purpose of yoga. First, now the regulations of yoga. Yoga is the restraint of the fluctuations, vrittis, of the mind stuff, chitta. And that includes, you know, the mind and emotions and sensations or whatever the mind goes through. This term chitta would include the mind, the ego, and the intellect. Then the seer abides in one's own true nature. That is when it is subsided. At other times, the seer is enmeshed and is identified with the fluctuations or expressions of the mind as part of nature. This implies that one, unless one is able to control the modifications of fluctuations or expressions of one's ego, intellect, or the mind, so that they are still and without any movement, then one can rest in one. Purusha being only when it's totally controlled and silent or quiet. So the basic purpose of yogic meditation is to reach that state of stillness in mental faculties. In a state of absolute peacefulness, the mind undisturbed and quiet attains the state of solitude or nirvana. And in touch with one's, what it considers one's true nature. At other times, according to Patanjali, we are entangled with the ever-changing flow of thoughts and feelings that are a product of nature. Often the mind is seen as waters of a lake. If the surface is disturbed by waves, one is enabled to see the deep within. Once the waters are calm and still and clear, one can see its depth without hindrance. In the calm mind, one becomes aware of one's true nature the self, or purusha, or atma, in a mind devoid of all disturbances and clear as a crystal, one will be able to comprehend one's true nature and rest with it. Continued practice and effort with non-attachment is needed to control such fluctuations. These occur, according to Patanjali, due to various causes, such as knowledge, if we know something, it affects our mind, misconceptions, obviously, delusion, sleep, because in sleep we are not actively controlling anything, and there are dreams and so on, except perhaps in very deep sleep, when there are no dreams, nothing. The mind is silent. It might be a possibility. But memory is always there to disturb us. The past comes in in thoughts and, you know, in all sorts of ways to disturb our mind. So Patanjali then lays down the preconditions for meditation, which are steadfast practice and non-attachment. Disengagement with the gunas. The gunas are the qualities of nature in Hindu theology. So unless one is 
disentangled with all these qualities of nature, attributes of nature. Only then one could realize one's true self of Purusha. The practice itself can be slow, medium, or intense. By dedication to Ishwara, God, or the divine being, or whatever one considers a higher one, it is possible to accelerate the process. One can reach Samadhi, the final goal. The process is aided by the chanting of Om. That's very commonly said in India. First uh, meditation is done by just the chanting of Om. That represents the cosmic vibrations and removes obstacles to the process. It is also aided by friendliness to the contented, compassion to the suffering, delight with the virtuous, and disengagement with the unrighteous. With controlled breathing, absorbed, unattached, and focused, the quiet mind becomes like a clear crystal with no differentiation between the knower, the knowing, and the known. The meditating mind, the process of meditation, and that which is meditated upon, merge in one homogeneous phase. The mind in such a state is likened by him to a translucent, luminous crystal. Translucent because anything that comes in goes through. It doesn't reflect ideas and thoughts and so on. Patanjali then lists some types of meditation. Initially, one is focused on an object or idea. And as the practice gains strength, one reaches a stage where the form and name of the object or idea loses coherence. And one is absorbed without any distinction between the subject and object of meditation. When even the seeds of past impressions dissolve, the absorption is complete. All separations vanish and now the absorption is totally complete. One rests its own, one's own true nature, which is the Atman or the self. And then of course you are in Kaivalya or Nirvana or whatever you want to call it. Now this sets out the principles of meditation. In the second part of, his, of the book, Patanjali goes on to describe a practice, a procedure to achieve it. And this procedure is uh, given it in two parts. The first one is called Kriya Yoga. And the second is called Ashtanga Yoga. While in Pida, Pada 1 or Part 1, discuss the theoretical aspects of meditation, this chapter deals with the practice and is applicable for the prospective student of yoga. Uh, Swami Vivekananda called this Raja Yoga. This section involves two methods. The first is called Kriya, as I said earlier. And the second is uh, Ashtanga. Initial preparatory practice of Kriya Yoga requires tetvas discipline in pursuing its requirements of austerity, spiritual study, and surrender to Ishwara, the Lord, or deity chosen by the person, who is considered as a special push. It doesn't have to be God. It could be Buddha or Mahavira or something. The obstacles to the practice, according to Patanjali, are ignorance, egoism, attraction or aversion, and clinging to existence. Remedy, he says, is unfaltering, discriminative discernment. To discriminate, the, the discriminating endless suffering is caused by karmic reactions of some scholars the nature one is born with, compounded by the three gunas or inherent qualities of nature. 
which are the effects which affect the psyche of the person. The root cause is the commingling of the Purusha and the Prakriti, the seer and the seen, which are the product of the gunas. This is also the reason for our clinging to existence, not realizing that the self or Purusha is immortal and not a part of this fleeting existence in Prakriti. So the remedy is unfaltering discriminative discernment. And that leads to the practice of the eight limbs of yoga. That's the, the next stage in the process. Patanjali this lists the eight limbs as part of the yoga practice, which he considers essential to reach the highest state of meditation, known as samadhi. Chapel considered this the eightfold path that follows a process of increasing subtilization starting with the external factors and steadily moving inwards to one's own physical or psychic nature. And these are yama abstinence, yama observances, asana postures, pranayama or control of the breaths, pratyahara or withdrawal inward of the senses, dharana which is concentration, dhyana which is meditation or contemplation, and finally samadhi which is complete absorption. In the first yama, one drops bad habits. In the second niyama, one develops positive attitudes. Next, one works on one's body, asana. Then the control of the breath, pranayama. This is followed by pratyahara, internalization of one's senses, or pulling the senses within, almost like a turtle withdrawing its limbs. That's the illustration which is always given. The last three steps of concentration, contemplation and uh, absorption deal with one's psychic inner world of increasingly subtle perceptions. Let us look at each one. In Yama, there is non-violence. In an attitude of non-violence, all hostility sees, truthfulness, and action and reaction become subservient, he says. In non-stealing, all things seem like gems. By continuous vigor and energy is gained. And by non-coveting, all one's needs are within reach. Then we go on to Niyam. Purity, contentment, austerity, self-study and contemplation. Contentment in one's position in life leads to happiness. Austerity is always helpful in achieving a state of, you know, my, you know internalizing. Self-study, by self-study he means reflection and introspection on whatever one learns about yoga and philosophy. Contemplation on Ishwar, since Ishwara or the Guru or some higher person always enables Samadhi, makes it easier to happen. Ishwara is defined as a God or a special Purusha. In asana postures, meditation has to be done in a steady, firm, and comfortable setting for long periods. It should be held without restlessness or distraction, undisturbed and with your spine erect. In later commentaries, Vyasa suggests 12 sitting positions. Still later in Hatha Yoga for Deepika, which comes perhaps from a different source, there are many more methods of asana, pranayama, various other systems which are suggested, but they are possibly belong to the Kundalini type of uh, meditation and not the one prescribed by Patanjali. So they should not be confused with the Hatha Yoga system, which is followed all over the place in the United States. Then comes Pranayama or breath control. Control of the breath involves in breathing and out breathing in a regulated manner. 
controlling the space and numbers and it's done short and long periods. There are various systems. There's an entire book I know on prana, which tells all the different methods. And recently, many other things have been added to it, like uh, holding back your muscles. It's called internal lock. And then sudden and, uh, sudden and very focused breathing. There are different kinds which have come in later over the 2,000 years. Um, but in Patanjali, it's this. That's controlled breathing done mainly with the purpose of learning to concentrate learning to, by focusing on the breath, to forget about other things going around. Then it comes to pratyahar, or withdrawal of senses inwards. All external stimuli have to be dropped, all the noises and stuff going on, uh, the children screaming next door, or you know something else going on, the cars, and everything, all of the kind of noises have to be, all external forms have to be. You know, you must get away from it all. And that's a mental process of withdrawing, internalizing of the senses. Pratyahara is a transition from the control of external forms to the next three limbs that control the inner state, a movement from the outer sphere of the body to the inner sphere of the spirit. So with that, we come to Vibhuti Pada, which is, consists of Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. Concentration, contemplation, and absorption. The three remaining limbs of yoga that are more psychological and physical are discussed in this chapter. From the external, we move to the world within. From Sankhya perspective, while leaving the lower nature of 20 elements and moving into the Chitta, which consists of the mind, the ego, and the intellect. Gaining control over them is the hardest of How is one to do it? Patanjali provides the following three steps. Dharana or concentration is an introspective focus on the object of meditation. It's an inner state of conscious mind that is brought to the condition of one-pointedness or singular focus on a place, object, or idea. It could be fixed on a mantra or a breath or a part of body or any other thing that can hold one's attention. The mind is to be fixed in concentration and should be controlled from flitting around. Dhyana, contemplation or reflection on the object. What transpires in this is a continuous flow of communication from the mind to the object of meditation. It is non-judgmental, non-presumptuous observation. I mean, you're not trying to judge what you see. You're not trying to analyze what you see. It's just observing. Dharana and Dhyana are integrally related. One is a steady state and the other a moving process of the mind. The first is static and the other a steady flow pure of pure observation. In Dharana, one is aware of thoughts. In Dhyana, you're not aware of thoughts, you're just there. An example of this is focusing waves lapping on the beach. At first, you were watching the wave, how big it is, how small it is, how it's against the rock and all that, but gradually you're so absorbed that you're no longer distinguishing one from the other. Then we come to samadhi or absorption. This last step in meditation happens when the object of meditation loses its independent form and results in unity with the mental process. The one who's meditating, the process of meditation, and the object of meditation are united in a continuous flow of experience. It is a state when the separation between the subject, the object, and the process is gone. The mind is fully absorbed, loses up its independent identity. The thinker, the thought process, fuses with the object of thought. The person is then sent to have attained samadhi or absorption. In such a state of absorption, as person is not aware of one's own separate identity from the trees or plants or people around them. There is only oneness. You feel, has a sense of unity with everything. Samyama is a word which is used when all the three are done together. That is when you practice enough of each one of these 
and reach that high state where it comes naturally to you. When Dharana, Dhyana and Samadhi are performed together on a particular object, it's called Samyama. Various Siddhis or powers are obtained by Samyama on an object, but that occurs only after perfection. By Samyama on different aspects of existence, the Siddhas make one capable of performing miracles like walking on water, reading the mind of others and knowing what's going on somewhere else and so on and so forth. But Patanjali warns that when such Siddhis are performed with ego, the powers will not work and the yogi may have negative consequences. So the powers when used sparingly for the benefit of others, for the benefit of humanity are possible, that it, they do work. But otherwise, it's advised not to indulge in them. The final state of not attachment, even to the Siddhis, even to these powers, is called Kaivalya or solitude. And that is the final stage in Patanjali's practice. In this final state of constant discriminative discernment, is called Dharma Megha Samadhi. In other words, one is in a meditative cloud of virtue. Here a person will seem to be in a permanent state of meditation, even when going around and performing his duties. It's like having a halo around your head. You know, many saints and all people always picture them with a halo. From the yogic perspective, that means he's in, a, in this meditative cloud of virtue. Here all effects of karma and guna sees the transformation Prakriti withdraws and Purusha, the immortal self with realization complete, rests in one's own true nature. The yogi has done attain nirvana. The metaphysics, uh, that's the final state. Sorry, I didn't put the. Here, all effects of karma and goodness cease. The metaphysics of Yoga Sutra is closely alike to the Sankhya theory. In all beings, living beings or jiva, the spirit of Purusha is enmeshed with nature, as in a state of delusion. Patanjali accepts the Guna theory of Sankhya, that all living beings and jiva are constrained. But he goes further and offers a practice to get across it. The three gunas, by the way, sattva is the quality of wisdom, compassion, and harmony. Rajas is one of passion, aggression, and craving. Tamas is one of ignorance, delusion, and stupidity. So one has to go climb from one step to the next as you keep out good karma. Cross all these gunas, and then you reach Kaivalya. The purpose of yoga is to remove from tamas to rajas to sattva. And finally, to transcend them all to reach liberation from their bondage. Unlike Sankhya, in which knowledge alone leads to liberation, Patanjali requires a disciplined practice, such as adherence to the eight limbs of yoga, to attain liberation or moksha. Further, whereas Sankhya clearly does not require a belief in Ishwara, Yoga Sutra does indicate that such belief would assist and even enhance the practice of meditation. Yoga is clearly alike to Sankhya and in, in its epistemology, both requiring pramana or evidence of direct perception, inference and testimony as proof of their reliability. In fact, all Indian philosophical system require this proof of perception, inference or testimony. The beliefs of Sankhya and even Yoga are not considered overtly theistic, since they do not connect to Brahman or Purusha. And Brahman to Purusha, they don't get linked. But they have been adapted by the more theistic Vedanta system for doing exactly that. The term Ishwara, Lord, used in Yoga Sutra can be interpreted to mean a deity such as a special god or guru who has reached Kaivalya. In this manner, the system of yoga has been adopted both by the Jainas and Buddhists on one side and the theistic Vaishnavas and Shaiva sects 
and other philosophically oriented Vedantins among the Hindus. Now it is spread outside India among those who have a variety of non-Indian beliefs and traditions. Finally, to end the Yoga Sutra Patanjali, I quote here a passage from Christopher Chap. The root and source of one's anxiety and pain are dukkha, thoughts. Dukkha are perpetuated because of past actions, which are generally fraught with impurity and affliction. But applying various techniques of yoga practice, the influence of past action slowly wears away, lessening the anxiety and pain associated with the human condition. For Patanjali, there's a reversal of the mind from outward obsession to inward stability as the highest of all human achievements. So this is about the Yoga Sutra. Now let us move on to the Gita. It is clear that historically, the yoga systems described in the sutra were closely allied to Shramana or Brahmanic tradition of renunciation asceticism. asceticism. People would move out of the homes and hearth and just walk out like the Buddha himself did, go out to the forest and there they'll indulge in meditation, what have you until they achieve uh, whatever they are hoping to achieve, nirvana perhaps. To find a more socially adaptable system of yoga, we have to turn to the book of Gita from the epic Mahabharata. Here is one is provided with methods of yoga more applicable to householders or those who are required to work and to attend to their family and, and domestic responsibilities. Here one can perform yoga while still executing one's prescribed her mind life. Before we turn to the study of yoga and the Gita, it's worth learning of the literary and spiritual context in which it is situated, and some of the concepts prevalent at the time of its composition. We already talked of the creation hymn in the Vedas, where the concept of Brahman or ultimate reality was proposed and referred as Tat. In later philosophical system, the concepts of individual self or spirit are referred to as Atma or Purusha. The individual being living entity is called Jiva, that function in Prakriti or primal nature. And embodied in Atma or Purusha or individual spirit or self inside, appearing to be seemingly attached to them. Human effort had, been directed, had to be directed by dharma or right action. The Gita is infused with the question of dharma. In fact, the whole of Mahabharata is what it is and how it should be followed. The Mahabharata war was between those who believed in dharma and those who were for other against right actions. That was the clash. Should one give in to karma desire or artha material gain as the Kauravas did? or in preference to dharma or right action, which was the Pandavas, the other side. How does one distinguish between one's own dharma and the needs of family, community, and nation? What happens in one's view or what is right conflicts with that of the community? How is one to act? These are the kind of questions Gita deals with in great detail. Calm, calmer desires and artha Acquisition seem to be at the root of all conflicts, but only when they are uh, led with other, pursued with other, or unrighteousness. Dharma was essential to lead a proper life. So desire and material gain pursued with dharma was the acceptable way. What is yoga and how does it help to follow dharma or attain moksha? The Gita is a practical treatise on yoga and provides different forms of yoga, which are shown to be essential to achieve salvation. Finally, there is the concept of moksha stated in the Gita, and it is meant liberation from the bondages of karma and kal, time, actions and time. In Gita, this is also tied to the concept of grace, since it comes under the influence of the theist devotees of Vishnu. But the grace of God or Guru 
moksha could be instantaneous. Otherwise, one had to resort to yoga of meditation or austerities or penance or whatever as a means the spiritual advancement. The Gita spells out other and more practical ways of yoga. They include karma, action, jnana, devotion, bhakti meditation, bhakti, I'm sorry, bhakti devotion, and dhyana meditation. The ultimate Vedantic goal of yoga in the Gita, then as now, is to transcend the limitations of the samsara or earthly existence and achieve union with that, the universal consciousness. The yoga of the Gita differs from traditional yoga. In that it's applicable for all peoples in society, irrespective of caste or creed or gender, and considers itself superior to traditional ritual. You know, the, the ritual that we do in the temples or the Vedic rituals one performs with the family and so on. While being easier, it's easier than renunciation. Along the way, it provides its vision of the supreme being and takes on the concept of avatar, or cosmic dharma. It discusses the role of the three qualities in nature and also the relationship between the human and the divine. In the Gita, the three systems, yoga, Sankhya, Yoga, and Vedanta, come together. The first two as tributaries, and the last as the mainstream in that river of knowledge. In the process, it gives us the vision of supreme being, concept of avatar, the three qualities, and the relationship between human and divine. Though the Gita is often studied as a standalone text, the epic Mahabharata, of which it is a central part, serves as the context in which it is said, and is therefore well worth a look. It makes clear of the nature of the terrible dilemma faced by Arjuna, the hero, at the commencement of the great battle of Bharat or India. It also provides us some knowledge of the relationship between the two, the two main characters of the Gita, one playing the role of warrior in a dreadful dilemma, questioning his own role in it, and the other that of his friend, philosopher, and guide. In giving him advice, Krishna seems to be showing all of humanity's ways to handle the vicissitudes of life and to find their own paths to salvation. Metaphorically seen, Arjuna and Krishna are the two aspects in each one of us. One caught in samsara, the outer world, senses, and the other, as Gandhi observes, the still small inner voice of reason or conscience within. Since Arjuna had to go out fighting, and Krishna remained as a charioteer, a witness, and not an active part in the battle, not an active participant, giving them advice but not taking part, they could well be considered to represent Prakriti and Purusha, our innate nature and the inner self of Sankhya, way of knowledge. Except in this case, the Purusha here is not totally silent. He is a non-participating friend, philosopher, and guide who doesn't hesitate to give his advice. The perpetual mythological conflict between the Devas, gods, and the Dhanava. The one representing order and other disorders recreated in human terms in the epic. Krishna as avatar of Lord Vishnu tries to correct the cosmic balance between the forces of order and disorder. Mahatma Gandhi considers that war to be an allegorical representation of the battle within our own minds between the action which seems right and the one which is more convenient. To him, Arjuna represents each one of us, and Krishna is the inner voice of conscience that points in the right direction. How does one make the right choice? In the Gita, Krishna teaches the ways of yoga. Bhakti, jnana, karma, dhyana, as a means to salvation. He also points to how dharma can be viewed in different ways, in extreme circumstances. The real message of the Gita, however, begins when at the start of the first day of battle, Arjuna asks his friend Krishna to drive him to the midpoint of the two armies 
so that he might get a good idea of how the antagonists are arranged to do battle. Krishna drives a chariot to a location from Arjuna could get the best view of those ready to fight. The seriousness of the situation suddenly hits Arjuna like a bolt from the blue. Is this right to fight for mere possession of land? Is it right to kill those whom one respects? One's cousins, friends, companions? What about their families, their elders, their women and children who will suffer as a consequence of war? Shudders in despair, drops his weapon, sinks to the ground and turns piteously to Krishna. Is it not a better way to get away from all this? Lead the life of a yogi in a forest and commit such deadly sins? Suddenly the sounds and clamor of armies ready to do battle fall silent. Time stands still for the next 17 chapters of the Gita, while the two friends are in deep discussion on the trials and tribulations of life and how to live in the right manner. In the deathly silence are two protagonists, one human, other divine, are steeped in their conversation. It is in this context in the Gita, Krishna presents his doctrine of yoga as a way to negotiate the trials and tribulations of life amid our daily battles, in preference to escaping it from all to the seclusion of some proverbial forest to lead the life of an ascetic quite opposite to what the Buddha did. In dissuading Arjuna from the desire to escape from his duties, Krishna lectures him on four types of yoga. Kama, karma, jnana, bhakti, and dhyana, which is action, knowledge, devotion, and meditation. These could be performed by lay persons and householders as distinct from Patanjali and yoga of meditation or dhyana. That required the practice of austerities and renunciation. As mentioned earlier in the talk on Yoga Sutra, Ashtanga yoga, which required a mental discipline and seclusion, was difficult to achieve for one also engaged in the daily duties of a profession or taking care of home and family. The Gita stresses that yoga is for all peoples with no distinction of caste or gender, caste or creed, and is more accessible to the lay public than the path of renunciation. So let's go on to each of these four. The way of knowledge of wisdom, Jnana Yoga. Krishna chides Arjuna on his conception of mortality and teaches him the distinction between the real immortal self and the unreal transitory physical psychological self. The wise mourn neither for the living nor for the dead, nor was I not, nor thou, nor these kings, nor any of us will cease to be hereafter. We are all not the body that goes through childhood, old age and death. The embodied one receives another body on death. And it's like changing garments. Unlike the body, that is imperishable, indestructible, and everlasting. Unlike the body, the Atman is neither slain nor ever slays. This no fire burns, the water's wet. This no wind doth dry, he says. This can be perceived neither by the senses nor by the mind. The state of all beings before birth is unmanifest. That middle state is manifest. The state after death is again unmanifest. This embodied one in the body of every body is beyond all harm. Clearly, this is Sankhya philosophy. And this is what Krishna is stating. And this is why sometimes in the Gita, he calls it Sankhya Yoga. When understanding rests steadfast and moved in concentration on Atman or self, only then is one established in yoga. When one is trying to understand this or investigate this idea or studying the texts that describe this, one is performing jnana yoga. And one reaches a state of realization of this, then becomes a jnana yogi. Then Krishna. 
Krishna describes such a person. A man of understanding bereft of all cravings of the mind finds comfort in his self. It is clear that in the Yoga Sutra, the confabulations of the mind are the essential cause of suffering. If one cannot control the mind, one is at peace. So it is the same as what the Sutra says. Whose mind is untroubled in sorrows and longs not for joys, who's free from passion, fear, and wrath, who owns attachment nowhere, who feels neither joy nor resentment, whether good or bad comes his way. That man's understanding is secure. This is a complete description of a jnana yogi or a yogi of knowledge. Attachment, desire, it gets craving, then wrath, then stupefaction, then loss of reason, and finally utter destruction. So in Krishna's view, desire in the long run, if unchecked, could lead to ruin. So in desire is a product of the ego. This association with one's ego through introspection is essential to overcome desires. The discipline one moving among sense objects without likes or dislikes, free from the sense of I or mine, is at peace. Krishna goes on to warn. Lust and wrath, born of Rajoguna, the quality of passion, are the arch devourer. As smoke obscures fire, they obscure knowledge and stupefy man. Gunas here refer to the qualities innate in nature, which are considered as the three, tamas, rajas, and sattva. Like I said earlier, tamas is a static quality of ignorance, apathy, and stupidity. Rajas is a quality of passion, aggression, and acquisition. They be the wars go on. They're an example of rajas, raja yoga. Sattva is a quality of balance, peacefulness, and harmony. All living beings have these three qualities in different measures, causing each person to have a distinct personality and natural tendencies. Controlling the self by the self that is subtler than the senses, the mind and the intellect destroy lust, the enemy. The seemingly simple statement appears to be the core of self-realization, but a self-realized soul is not likely to identify oneself with the desires of the body. These then are the essential features of Jnana Yoga, the way of knowledge. The self as Atma here is the Purusha of Sankhya. The difference being the Atma is also a ray of Paramatma or Brahman, the universal consciousness that is immortal, eternal, and all pervading. The self in each one of us is a witness within but not the doer or enjoyer of our actions. The self-realized person here achieves moksha or liberation and is yoked to the chosen deity who merges with the universal consciousness or Brahman upon leaving one's earthly life. Let us now come to karma yoga. Krishna realizes that Arjuna is a man of action, a warrior. To him, the way of knowledge and wisdom or renunciation would not come naturally. It had to be preceded by a yoga closer to his natural tendencies. For this, Krishna suggests the way of action or karma yoga. Doing one's duty with resolute determination, undeterred by pleasure or pain, loss or gain, victory or defeat one will not incur sin. He decries the traditional belief in the performance of rituals as karma, as the traditional religious practice goes on all over the place, at least among the Hindus, to obtain some reward or suggest something, you know, get something from God. And here he suggests a higher and nobler truth. Action alone is your right, never the fruits thereof. Let not your motive be to the fruits of action, 
nor should you desire to avoid action. Act without attachment, steadfast in yoga, even-minded in success or failure. Even-mindedness is yoga. These are the most quoted lines in defining the essence of karma yoga. Excuse me for a minute. Trini Moss, just so our audience knows, um... Your talk originally was going to go about another 15 minutes or so, and there'll be time for questions yes. and discussion. Okay. Yes, that's why I'm trying to find a way to finish it. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Doing one's duty with resolute determination, undeterred by pleasure or pain, loss, victory again. I think we have gone through this. One gifted with an attitude of detachment frees oneself from the effects of deeds, good and bad. Be devoted to yoga. Yoga is skill in action. This was the motto of the college I went to, the engineering school. Yoga, her karma, sukhashtalam. Yoga is skill in action, but is also in performance of yoga is skillful living. That's another way of putting it. Acting with skill here implies acting with dedication, under the spirit of service, not with selfish motives. If one acts for the good of a higher cause for the country or for the environment or some other higher ideal, for the good of humanity, that'll constitute karma yoga. By not undertaking an action, one cannot get freedom from work, nor by the renunciation of action. Actions are inborn. One has to act as long as one lives, one way or another. That is a given truth. The point is whether one acts selflessly with wisdom or not. No one can exist without action, for that is born of the qualities of gunas or nature, prakriti. That man who acts, keeping all his senses under control, without attachments, performing karma yoga, excels. Actions dedicated to work on hand, without distractions of desires and expectations, would constitute karma yoga. A spirit of service is essential. Performing action without attachment maintains the supreme. Unattached, the unenlightened man should act for the welfare of humanity. It is clear from the above that Krishna is in favor of selfless service like most of the volunteers who perform their chosen duties. Even if one works in job in the performance of one's duties, if it's done with dispassion, and dedication, and without the distraction and expectation of rewards, a concern for the reaction of others, it would form karma yoga. Proper actions are to be done with a proper attitude, as service rather than doing it for one's own pleasure. Such work would give one greater satisfaction, inner satisfaction and peace of mind than work done with an aim for personal or material gain. Service, not profit, is the motive of a karma yogi. In fact, when I look back on my life, I worked for many, many years. Uh, the part of work which I do remember are those, uh, those few moments when I was really dedicated and not thinking of some other things. So I think there is some truth in this. Okay, let's come to the next to this, which is uh, bhakti yoga. There's no other way more natural than human condition than love. When that love is focused on a higher power, a divine presence, or the deity of one's choice, it is sublime. It lifts one to a level of selfless existence that no other method can match. In that yogic union of the lover and love, not even liberation or moksha is required. It is complete in and of itself. He who sees me in all things and all things in me 
he's never separated from me, nor I am ever separated from him, says Krishna. The me here implies the divine, which is the essence in all things. He who sees the divine in all is forever in ecstasy. He who established in unity worships me as the indweller of all beings. That yogi abides in me. There exists this divine essence in our innermost being. There are many stories in India of such persons being transformed from a criminal to a saint. For example, Valmiki, the composer Ramayana, was said to be a thief before he had a revelation. And then he went on praising Rama, the righteous, famous epic. And among all yogis, he who's worshipped me with faith, his innermost self merged in me, is indeed deemed by me to the best of yogis. The me, as I said here, represents the deity, the supreme being, the ideal purusha, one who worships as one's personal ideal. It can also mean all of humanity, since Krishna exists in every, as a self in every person. Arjuna asked Krishna whether those who worship a personal deity such as him or those who worship an unmanifest Brahman were the better. He replied that in his opinion, the best yogins were those who with their minds riveted on him, worship him, since it's harder for mortals to focus on the unmanifest. There are many temples to anthropomorphic gods and goddesses in India but I've never come across one to the abstract reality. It is clear that Krishna viewed the devotion to a personal deity as one's choice as easier to follow than to the abstract concept of a universal unseen power. Though in the end, one would realize that personal deity in the ultimate analysis is just a representation of the universal phenomenon. In Sanskrit, the words saguna and nirguna with qualities of nature and without the qualities of nature are the two terms to signify a personal deity and the impersonal Brahman. Set your mind steadily on me, and if you cannot reach me by constant practice, then try undivided service and dedicate all to me. With mind control, abandon the fruits of action. Here he seems to combine bhakti and karma yoga, work done as a form of devotion to higher fruits would serve the same purpose as one devoid of selfish desires. One could say that karma yoga becomes bhakti yoga when work is done as a dedication to a higher cause or for the welfare of humanity. Swami Vivekananda considered bhakti yoga to be essentially dualist. The lover must have a beloved. The bhakti yogi must have a deity to be devoted to. But the human and divine are ultimately in the final analysis through yoga, they get united. This complete union, or at the very least, they are yoked together in a yogic union. A wave could be said to be separate from the ocean, or you can say that wave and the ocean are the same. Okay, now we come to the last of them. Uh, which is Dhyana Yoga. Finally, in keeping with the existing tradition of the times, Krishna also extols the renunciation of those who live a normal working life of a householder, follow the path of meditation, because this was being done throughout the ages, long, you know, for 4,000 years. So the Patanjalian system was an existing way. So he had to accept this also. He states that the yogi should neither eat too much nor too little, sleep too much or too little. He clearly differs from the classical notion that the yogi is an ascetic who has renounced all pleasures. He says to Krishna, moderation in all things was enough. One who has shut out contact with external senses, sits with the gaze fixed between the eyebrows, made equal as in-breath and out-breath, his mind, senses, and reason held in check with no desire for fear or anger. Such a man of meditation is free forever. One whose heart is filled with contentment of wisdom and realization 
whose conquered senses and to whom a lump of earth, a stone or gold seem the same. Such a person is steadfast in yoga. He goes on to describe the requirements of meditation. A yogi should practice meditation, concentrating on the self in solitude with mind and body control, free of desires and possessions. Fixing oneself in a clean spot, a seat neither too high or not too low, covered with grass, etc. There seated, mind focused, the functions of thought and senses and control, one should practice the yoga of self purification. By Brahmacharya, in this context, Brahmacharya was followed uh, by the Patanjali system. For Krishna, it is belief in Brahman, the infinite consciousness. And therefore, a yogi who has got his mind on Brahman is doing uh, the yoga of, of dhyana yoga or meditation. Keeping his mind steadfast, focused on the self, one attains the peace of nirvana residing in me. Then we come to the ultimate yogi. We'll end with this. Arjuna complained that the mind is constantly swayed by restlessness. It wanders all over the place. It's turbulent, strong, and unyielding. It's hard to control as the wind. Krishna admits that senses of the mind are wayward and difficult to control, but by discipline and dedicated practice and renunciation, one needs to master the senses. When the fickle and unsteady mind wanders, it should be reined in and brought into the sway of the self. For supreme bliss comes to a yogi, who with mind become, with passion still, has become one with Brahman. Such a yogi looks with an impartial eye, saying Atman in all beings and on beings in Atman. And for the last quote, Krishna, before the end of the Bhagavad Gita, says nonviolence, slowness to wrath, serenity, aversion to slander, slander, tenderness to all lives, gentleness of qualities of divine heritage. These, I think, are the aims of this society. One can see how the difference between bhakti yoga, jnana yoga. The former sees devotion, sees all with devotion, and the other sees all with equanimity. The one sees the divine deity in all, and the other sees the self in all. And finally, I think bhakti yoga and jnana yoga are the ultimate types of yoga one can have. The teachings of yoga can thus be utilized by anyone. And that would be the end of this talk, except that if you wanted me to go on and talk about uh, transmission to the United States, I could do that also. Okay. A couple of words, well, it depends on you. Oh, uh, thank you so much for Nuas. That was um, quite a journey you took us on, um, so uh, beautifully organized and synthetic and touching on so many key points of these traditions. So we'd like to um, invite everyone to, uh, if they have a question, to raise their hand and um, we could have a bit of discussion at this point. Or you can raise it in the chat box. And I see Carolyn. Please go ahead, Carolyn. I would like to, this is beautiful and very helpful. I've always found Patanjali's um, a little beyond or above my understanding, but this was bringing everything right to um, a level where we could, um, we could indeed um, learn from your clarity. Uh, but I would like to maybe just a little bit hear about yoga coming to the West. Um, not, I mean, we could do a whole seminar on that, but um, is it about the same or is it been kind of been twisted around? 
So I don't know about others, but I would like to hear a few minutes of the transatlantic or transpacific um, uh, passage. There is, there is a book written on that will help that, but would you like to say anything about the transmission to the West? Sure, sure, sure. I could, I mean, if you have the time, I, could, I have a, I could show a few slides there, like that uh, was mentioned earlier by Kirk, uh, a friend of mine wrote a book actually on this, this very subject. Uh, I think you mentioned his name, right? Goldberg? Yeah, Goldberg. And uh, I've talked to him many times. Sorry, I forgot his name. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a few slides. If you want, I could show that and tell you. The, the, the main difference is that over the centuries after these things were written, there were other practices that took control or other took precedence. And the main thing was the concept of Kundalini. Kundalini, and I'll show you a diagram if you want. Can I proceed back to the... Sure. Where do I get back to my slides? I just wanted to make sure we also leave time for other questions on the material okay, you've already okay. presented because so, there, there's so much you've given us. And I, if there's... Uh, okay, let, let me... Let me put it in a summary then. That'd be great, yeah. Uh, the Kundalini uh, form of yoga is that it's based on the Shiva Shakti principles. Shiva is the eternal principle, universal principle, and Shakti is energy that permeates in this universe as matter. You know, I'm sure every scientist would agree to that. My background is Western science and technology. Makes sense to me. And what it says is, though, and this is something, is the Kundalini Yoga, is that this particular energy in a human being stays at the bottom of the spine and it works up the spine and to the crown through various chakras or centers. And that is held by different movements of the body, like doing the asanas and also by the breathing exercise, by holding the stomach inside in Banda, and so on and so forth. It's all described in, uh, in the various books, like uh, uh, there's a book on yoga from medieval times, uh, which was called, I forget the name at the moment, but it covers all this. So there were many other books written during that period of time that covered Kundalini yoga. And that seems to be the basis for the asanas. And therefore the asanas are postures, which in uh, Patanjali and also in the Gita is only sitting at a place and meditating, uh, got modified into doing a number of movements to accelerate the process of enlightenment. So that is why by the time it came to the West, uh, the practical physical side, gained a lot of prominence. It gained prominence because of uh, some of the gurus like uh, Krishnamacharya from Mysore, the school to which I went, Kaivalya Dharma. The person was a doctor and he used yoga for therapy and he started yoga therapy in India. And some of the others, Shivananda, for example, and the Shivananda Ashram studios everywhere in, in this country, so they got more prominence in the United States than uh, the philosophy of the Gita and philosophy of the Yoga Sutra, which are more basic, more fundamental, and uh, are perhaps more suited for those who are very serious students of spirituality, whereas for the lay public, uh, perhaps doing Hatha Yoga, uh, Hatha Yoga Pradipika, by the way, that's the name of that I was thinking of by Shwatarama. Uh, he wrote it in, I think, 15th century or something. And he described uh, more asanas, bandha, or in, internal locks, and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? To this country, I think, yes. the interest started with Emerson, uh, like Goldberg says in his book. And then it went on to the Theosophical Society, and, you know, Madame Blavatsky and others. 
who were interested in Indian wisdom. And then it was Swami Vivekananda, I think, the first person who actually physically came, lectured on it in the 1890s and then stayed for a year in America and started not only uh, uh, the Vedanta Society was started by him, but he uh, wrote a book called Raja Yoga, describing Patanjali's Yoga Sutra in a more modern manner. So he was a tremendous contributor. And after him, so many others who come. Yogananda came and started a Self-Realization Fellowship, which is here in United, in, right here in California. And then, uh, uh, what is that? The gentleman who brought in meditation, 15-minute meditation, what was his name? I forget. And there's so yeah, many what, others. Well, come, you know. Is it Isherwood you were thinking of? Sorry, who? Christopher Isherwood. Christopher Isherwood uh, wrote a book on yoga. He also mm -hmm. wrote a book, you know, Christopher Isherwood and Swami Pradhav, Prabhavananda. They mm -hmm. wrote a book. Mm -hmm. And then my friend Chris Chappell has written a book on Yoga Sutras too, mm -hmm. calling it Yoga the Luminous. So, so many books have come out. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was thinking of uh, a, a person who came to teach, which actually Goldberg was in that program teaching a 15 minute meditation practice. You know, you just do it every day for 15 minutes and so that's enough to keep you going. <laughs> you know? So, uh, so uh, Srinivas, I see another hand raised here. I was wondering if we could take another question. Is that okay? No, sure. Was that Robert? Yeah, uh, Srinivas, going back to the Yoga Sutras, <clears throat> Patanjali, before uh, the practice of dharana, you know, perfect focus on a single point, there's the withdrawal of the senses, you know, pratyahara, where there's this, this total from the senses. That itself seems like a kind of abstract concentration. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think even... Uh, uh, the breathing exercises we do, from that we begin concentration because you start focusing on your breath. You know, after that, every other stage is deeper and deeper into getting away from the outside world and look going within. So pratyahara is like in between the first stages, which are mainly physical, and the last three stages, which are purely psychic. So it kind of connects the two by getting out of the outside world, trying to focus more and more so that you can't even hear what's going on outside. Mm -hmm. You would sit near an ocean and there are people walking behind you, screaming in the beach, but you're so focused on those waves that you see nothing else but the waves. It's difficult, but you know, these are things which take place sometime over years, sometimes over lifetimes, you know, before you reach perfection. <laughs> At least I haven't reached perfection. <laughs> well, thanks uh, for that's, getting that. <laughs> that's a good answer, though. Thank you. Uh, so I see two more hands up. We have Jerry Lewin. Um, yes, thank you so much. Um, just so rich in your presentation. Thank you. Um, my question is what is the relationship? between self-consciousness and Ishvara. In other words, how, do, how are we to think of the one making the effort toward self-purification and freedom? As far as the, the Gita goes, and what the way Gandhi describes it, or Gandhi interprets it anyway, he says that Sir Krishna is in each one of us as our innermost conscience. He says, the voice within is the way he describes that Krishna was the voice within and the external actor is Arjuna. So Ishwara or God is both outside and within us. That's where perhaps it could be confusing. How can somebody outside be also within us? But that is a philosophy that you can pray to the God outside too. It doesn't matter. It goes to the same source. All these, as Krishna says somewhere, 
all your prayers to all the deities come to me. One thing about him was he was not modest. He, he was willing to accept all prayers, whether it was to Jesus or to Buddha or anyone. He said, everything finally comes to me. Just like all the rivers finally come to the ocean. In the same way, uh, devotion in any form reaches the same source, the source of everything, which is Brahman or that, as it said. And that is why there's a famous saying, Tatvamasi. That's the, one of the most famous sayings. It's called Mahavakyas, the great sayings of the entire Vedas. You may not read all the Vedas, but if you know these two, three sayings, that is enough. And it says, Tatvamasi, that thou art. That which we all search in is right there inside you. So search within. Does that answer your question? Very good answer. Thank you. That was a beautiful answer, Srinivas. Thank you. So I see uh, Renee's hand. Renee Tillotson, are you, are you there? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I am. Uh, yes, thank you for just such an illuminating um, talk, Srinivas. So, so appreciative. This is um, perhaps a more practical question. Um, from the standpoint of yoga in the Bhagavad Gita, if one is plagued by devotion, by emotion, which um, must stem from the, the desire nature. Uh, where does the solution lie? And does that depend on which of the paths one is following? Exactly. I think you said it right. Mm. In my opinion, it depends on which path will suit you. Ah. In other words, how would you transform that feel it in a way that it's directed towards either that inner self or externally towards the divine. It depends on how you, you know, bhakti is perhaps the best. For an emotional person, there's nothing like bhakti yoga. Mm -hmm. And there are so many examples in Indian history of these bhakti yogis, you know, one blinded himself for the sake of Krishna. He says, Look, you're not coming in front of me. If I blind myself, then I'll be able to see you. And his famous Surdas, and his songs are sung even now. It's one of the great devotees. So it depends on how you translate your emotion into something which helps you to go beyond the limitations of this life mm. and reach a higher state of consciousness. That's the way I think. So if perhaps one were more of a karma yogi, one might find uh, works to do. Oh and yeah, that too. Or a yana yogi, one might redirect one's thoughts. Correct, exactly. Right? Absolutely. And I see. And then the uh, follower of um, dhyana or raja yoga, uh, they would direct themselves to the self study jnana yoga would devote himself to study to understand no, dhyana dhyana okay dhyana is meditation yeah, yeah that is raja yoga yeah yes he will look to sit aside at some portion of the day every day and i'll give you an example it used to help me a lot i was in you know manufacturing in this country can be crazy people are driven to profit and they make it, drive everybody to the, you know, <laughs> to the last bit in that world. It helped me a lot at the end of the week. I was teaching a yoga class once a week. Mm. And when I went for the class for that one hour that I thought did it, and because I was teaching, I had to do it correctly. I felt it was required of me. Or maybe I was selfish. I was using all these people to do yoga properly, put it either way you like. So by doing this yoga properly, the asanas and the breathing exercises 
and the shavasana where you lie down as if you are dead you know and i don't know if you've done yoga finally you stretch yourself and just lie flat on the ground when i finished it and got up from that i used to feel completely refreshed i could go back to work right there in the evening for another 8 hours if somebody asked me <laughs> so i think it's like a renewal process if you do the normal asana yoga also it's a wonderful renewing process particularly if you are exhausted from work or whatever then do it and after that you feel so good provided you do it correctly which means very the way i was taught in kaivalya dham uh, the exercises had to be done with great focus within yourself if you're moving your hand you completely focus on the movement of the hand if you're doing a breathing exercise you completely focus on the movement of the breath so it teaches one to focus on things and get away from other ideas which have been bothering you anxieties and worries and things so i think it was to me it was a great help doing that once a week and i would recommend to anyone to try it out at least to see if it works for them Mm. Okay. So that would particularly it sounds like help the path of the karma yogi someone who's very involved in works. Yes, provided those works are not with a selfish motive. For example, if you work with an idea of doing the job as good as you can, the pleasure that itself will give you pleasure because later on you'll say this has done so much good for people. this work that i did or it could in general it is improved technology or whatever they have made a contribution doing a contribution is always far more uh, you know helpful to you in the sense of giving you a peace of mind than doing it uh, thinking of how soon can i get the job done and go home or look for a promotion or something like that that's what yeah. that's what karma yoga is all about so in every way these yogas whether it's karma yoga or dhyana yoga or bhakti yoga i don't think they can do any harm so <laughs> it can definitely do some good <laughs> thank uh, you so much <laughs> yeah shrinivas we're just recalling that uh, goldberg in his uh, in his book uh, american veda he says <laughs> that uh, that emerson was the first dhyana yogi in of the US that uh, Thoreau was the first karma yogi and Walt Whitman was the first bhakti yogi and yeah. and he says uh, and he uh, he starts many of his lectures and he'll say does you know has anyone been influenced in their spiritual quest by uh, indian philosophy and you know a few people will raise their hands and then he will say well has anyone read emerson you know and a few other people raise their hands how about thoreau how about whitman and he says that uh, that is through them and then a whole series of others um like uh, the beatles <laughs> for oh, example yes, like uh, allen ginsberg like allen watts um and the whole hippie movement really that that indian philosophy was being transmitted and infused into our culture through all of these influences whether they use the the terminology of indian philosophy or not refers to specific practices or not that through their own lives and writings and words that they sort of transmitting into the culture this sort of the underlying basis and influence of it so that is uh yeah it's it's remarkable to think of it that way that even you know without the specific knowledge that you are pointing to in the terms and definitions that still the sort of the underlying practices and ideas are have permeated the culture in a certain way. Oh yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And Emerson actually wrote a beautiful poem on Brahma. Mm. And uh, Walt Whitman is supposed to have taken the Gita with him when he went to the Walden Book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he did. He, he, took, it, he, he had the Gita with him. Gita, <laughs> Gita yeah. with him for the one year he spent yeah. at the park. Yeah. So I agree with you absolutely that they all were influenced. Uh, but the greater influence came after vivekananda when you started having these people establishing organizations 
in different yeah. parts of the United States, you yeah. know, like the Self-Realization Fellowship, mm -hmm. where uh, Yogananda came and stayed here. He didn't go out. And then various others, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, that's the gentleman who are Philip Goldberg's guru, who taught mm -hmm. the 15-minute uh, yoga, various things. So, uh, so I, I quite agree with you that now it has become part of uh, almost becoming a world culture because it's not only here in Europe, it's very popular. I know I was sent by an American uh, company, I mean, engineering company here to Moscow for almost a year. And I was surprised to see, and in those days, uh, the Russian government did not encourage non-Catholic Christian, they only approved of four religions and nothing else was allowed. But I did find a place where they used to recite the yoga Vedas beautifully and do yoga mm. right in the heart of Moscow. Mm. So there were influences even in Russia at that time. And I think there are influences in Europe quite a bit. Mm. Uh, so, and United States most of all, I think it is, there are a lot of these gurus who come, we call them jet age gurus, yeah. who come and give talks. And right now there's one, I think in LA, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. He comes and gives talks, and he's got a lot of following. Yeah. Also, the, um, the sorry, go ahead. Go on. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, um, the, as you mentioned in your talk, uh, you yourself were taught by Theosophists, and the Theosophical movement also, uh, which was had its uh, beginnings in uh, on the East Coast of the United States, and had a worldwide uh, um, interest uh, in the um, late 1800s and early 1900s, and it waned since then. But they also, of course, were teaching the, you know, the fundamental truths of, uh, of Eastern philosophy, as well as uh, Buddhist uh, um, ideas and teachings. It's very much infused into the theosophical stream. Yeah. But I, I had a, um, a, a question I was, that I, for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so I was, uh, I, I love the way that you characterize the Gita as uh, being uh, sort of universally applicable to whether one was a householder or quote unquote a yogi, uh, whatever station or class or caste of life that this, the, the Gita was directed to, to all persons. Um, and, um, but I was a little confused because uh, one of the ways that you characterized it, characterized uh, um, karma yoga, for example, was being uh, easier than renunciation and um, meditation uh, as, as a path. And uh, it seems, and then, but then when you read, for example, from the second chapter, um, that uh, action, that karma yoga is action without attachment to the fruits of action. That seems like a very much a form of renunciation. Absolutely, absolutely. So In I was wondering fact, if you could maybe help sort that out a little bit. Absolutely, Krishna says that. He says that this too is renunciation. I mean, it may not be the renunciation of going out in the forest and leaving everything behind, but mm -hmm. even doing karma, with a sense of offering is renunciation when you're not doing it for personal benefit. So mm -hmm. it says you are giving up your desires, your, uh, you know, wanting to get something and doing work as service. That too is a form of renunciation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's exactly what he says. So mm -hmm. that too, in a way, is renunciation, but it is still not going into the forest, not getting away from it all. The, the other one, like the Buddha did, he left his palace, he left his wife, he left his child, and went off into the forest, which is common in India. When I was last visit of India, I was in a place called Rishikesh, and I came across this, uh, you know, on the steps down to the Ganges River, there is the ashram of Swami Shivananda. We went there, and then we were coming down to the river, and this young man was there, and I started chatting with him. And he says he's left his wife and child back in South India and come a thousand miles in search of the truth. 
He said, I'm not going back. I'm just going to be here and then I'm going to pursue. This, is, this kind of madness is especially Indian. We, mm. we have this madness somewhere in us that some of us just want to get out and search what is the truth behind all this. Mm. What is behind all this facade of, you know, that goes on and then we die and then we are nowhere. We come from nowhere. We die and go nowhere. So what's all this going on? Yeah. So there is always that. So you, would you say then that any person, no matter their station of life, no matter their occupation, uh, family, no family, whatever, that, that um, if, they, if they learn to act without attachment to the fruits of action, that they that would be a way of entering into yoga as described in the great absolutely class. absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely 100 yeah. percent that's the best it's karma yoga yeah. and that will lead from what the gita says it is done with a devotion to a higher ideal in the end it also becomes like bhakti yoga mm -hmm. karma yoga itself is an act of love mm -hmm. In the end, everything is either an act of meditation or an act of love. Mm. Mm. See, yeah. those who seek knowledge, you seek the yoga of knowledge, that too in the end becomes like a yoga of meditation because you're meditating on that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. So um, I see Ray's hand up. You have a question for Srinivas or comment? Oh, just. Um... I'm just curious, in your study of Patanjali, which seems to be very well informed and, and deep, what commentaries did you use, uh, besides perhaps Budget's commentary, in order over your period of study? Sorry, what was that again? Uh, Whose commentary? In, well, in your study of Patanjali's, what, uh, and since you came from a, um, a, um, the background that you did, what commentaries did you use besides Judge's commentary, which is found in, um, in his, tra his uh, translation? I've got some books here. I can show you the book. Uh, Just a name. One is by Swami Satchidananda. He has written a, a book on uh, the Yoga Sutra. Then there is, I think, uh, one of the uh, Swami Prabhavananda and Christopher Ishawood. I read that long ago. So these are the few books I read. This and one more, I think. And uh, Thank you. they go verse by verse and, and describe it. So I, I have a bunch of them in the back. <laughs> I can show them to you if you like. Well, that's fine. I just just was curious if you you know you had any special ones that were yeah. Of... But they all seem to say the same thing. I mean, it's not much. There's not much deviation one from the other. But then, I have not read the classical commentaries. I have not read the commentaries by the famous ones uh, that were done over the centuries that I described in my talk. I have only read what we get in a bookshop here in uh, the Bodhi tree or somewhere, you know, or, or the Vedanta Society. I just read books that are available here and in English. I have not read in Sanskrit. I have mm. not read the commentaries in Sanskrit. Mm. Are you familiar with uh, Taimani's uh, Science of Yoga? No. Okay. That's, that's an excellent uh, commentary and explanation. Ja, Jaimini? Taimini, T-A-I-M-I-N-I. Taimini. It's very detailed, um, brilliant. And he, he okay. has a background in uh, Sanskrit um, and yeah. deeply, deeply enmeshed in the Indian tradition. But uh, No, I'm not. I, in fact, after I retired, I tried to read the first Sanskrit book I tried to read was the Ramayana, it took me three years. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I had to noble effort. Eat because I was completely, you know, brought up in 
Western science and technology, right? So earlier yeah. you talked, asked me about the theosophists, and I just wanted to make a comment uh -huh. that sure. in the school where I went, which was run by theosophists, that one unusual thing, which was not done in any other Indian school, was that every evening, this was a boarding school, by the way, we stayed, lived there. Mm. After our day's work and after the games and everything, we had to take a wash, change, and come to a semicircular theater, like an open air theater, you could say, and sit in it overlooking the sunset. The school was in a fortress, an ancient fortress in India. Overlooking that were mountains and you know the sunset was there. We had to come at sunset, sit around that, and we were asked to meditate. And that was the hardest part in <laughs> school days when we wanted to throw chalk at each other <laughs> to <laughs> sit down. And these theosophists, they would either give a story from the Jataka tales or something, some other tale from ancient India. And then, uh, or somebody would sing a bhajan, uh, a song, and they wanted. Mm -hmm. And then we were asked to sit quiet, all of us, uh, to kids from, you know, fifth standard to the twelfth. My goodness, that was the most difficult part of the day for us. Really? Those ten minutes of meditation to keep absolutely silent and sit quiet. Uh -huh. So I, I now I realize how wonderful it was. Mm. And when I see a sunset, I feel like sitting somewhere on a bench, <laughs> being quiet being quiet for a few minutes and I think of my school days with mm. these theosophists. Mm. So I do owe it to them, uh, you know, you've got the fundamentals. <laughs> well, Srinivas, it's um, time, our time is almost up and one of my duties today is to uh, what's called the traditional vote of thanks. And, uh, you know, there's so much that you uh, gave today um, but what seems to me to uh, have been so clearly laid out, uh, someone who has spent, as you pointed out, years uh, becoming familiar with these uh, philosophies and outlooks of the Indian tradition, some of the most revered and uh, ancient uh, texts of Hinduism, and have through that study and incorporation into your own practice and life, um, gain such a clarity about the key, what the key points are. And the way you first of all took us through Patanjali, as Carolyn pointed out, in such, uh, with such clarity, giving us definitions along the way um, on keywords and the steps of uh, leading to uh, the development of the practice of meditation, and also the way that you characterized yoga as uh, a means adopted by uh, various traditions. And you mentioned the uh, Vedanta, the Buddhist and, and the Jain tradition, all who incorporate all or various aspects of the yoga tradition as a means towards uh, self-realization. Um, it was it was beautifully done. It was very clearly done. It was very accessibly done, and I thank you for that. And I, like Carolyn, I've uh, I um, have read Patanjali, but always feeling like he was pointing to regions of consciousness <laughs> which were so far distant uh, and um, um, elevated that um, you know had little. Um, um, I had little uh, capacity for actually uh, comprehending what he was talking about, but somehow you made it accessible for us. And then bringing in the Gita as well, um, which, uh, you know, is a lifetime study for, for many people, uh, revered as the great Hindu classic and the study of, of um, the greatest uh, minds of the age. And again, you took us through the key points of the four main uh, branches of yoga as described in the Gita um, with key quotes and key explanations that were uh, so beautiful and evocative uh, and helped us gain um, a much clearer picture 
of what might be possible for any of us who were wanting to enter into this, the uh, practices being uh, pointed to, and uh, also gave us, uh, just by your, your reading of the passages, evoked some of the, um, you could say, uh, the sanctity and the, um, the um, sort of elevated uh, tonality uh, that, that's contained in the, in the books themselves. So we're, we're very, very appreciative. And then also your, the way you handle the questions. <laughs> Just uh, uh, a very clear to the point um, and in a way, sort of like, um, you know, Uncle Srinivas, very friendly. <laughs> uh, I'd like to get to know you much better. This is our first time really having a conversation. So um, I'm, I'm very grateful. And on behalf of the Institute, I want to thank you deeply for your offering today. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah, thank you very much, Srinivas. It's beautiful. So uh, our, um, the Institute schedule for uh, the upcoming month is unknown, is unsettled at the point, at this point, but uh, there is a, a 